Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks, first of all, for inviting me. Once again, I really enjoyed two years ago being here, and this year is not that much different. It's, it's a great conference, I guess. Uh, this year, even a little bit bigger, actually, so I'm happy to see it growing. Um, yeah, today's talk will be about building the AI machine. This is an initiative that we saw the last year. And those of you who know me, at least now after the introduction, might have noticed that it's all centered around finance. So this is actually what we do and do exclusively with Python. So I can do much more, as we have seen already here throughout the day. And I think yesterday and tomorrow as well. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about background, how I see um, the current field for finance evolving. And I will then introduce you to the project that is mostly based on Python, of course, but I won't show that much code. So sometimes I give uh, talks as well where you only see code, but this one is more a high level one. <coughs> Let me get started with a uh, quick introduction. So this is actually what everybody's after in our field. So I recently got forwarded this email and I was asked whether this is possible to turn 1 million into 3 a 3 billion a return and actually this competition what this refers to um, that was um, held over the course of eight weeks so it's not even a, a yearly return it's not a 10-year return it should be possible according to the text there that students actually turn 1 million into 3 a 3 billion I don't know how this is possible technically beyond any arbitrage um, I could imagine some things there um, but actually, I don't know of any kind of instrument that will be that liquid that it can really cash out 383. So there might be a little bit hype behind it, but I just wanted to introduce it because the holy grail in finance, I think, is to make money, uh, lots and tons of money, starting with just a small uh, budget from the beginning. My talk will be mostly about algorithmic trading and algo trading beyond these fantastic returns that I still don't believe is there to stay it has established itself since years in the equities markets so share trading is more than 50 percent driven on a daily basis by algos not that many people uh, there are these typical quotes i use one as well regularly from the economist that goldman sachs has reduced equities traders from 600 to two only but at the same time of course increasing it staff and data analysts and data scientists um, but here in the area which my talk will be partly at least about and FX trading it was kind of surprising for me to read this rather recent article that just one in ten traders as they say so there is no kind of number with regard to volume just one in ten traders what they state currently use algos and that this is probable to be increased over yeah, a short period of time because if some people start using more sophisticated algorithms than others, then um, there, there is the arms raise that is started immediately. So algorithmic trading is something that is there, not in every corner of the finance industry, but I think um, it doesn't take long until it will be omnipresent in our industry. The agenda for my talk today is as follows. Quick introduction what we do, a little bit of background, then I will go over data-driven finance, so not only other areas like big data companies, the web companies, the data firm these days, finance has become that way as well, and AI taking now a big foothold in our industry. So this is the second um, topic here. I will then show how such an AI-based strategy might look like. It's just an example strategy in that sense, but kind of to get a feel what this is all about, and then I will talk about the AI machine, and I will close with a quick outlook brief Outlook at the end. You know what we do at the Python Quants, uh, the introduction said it already, it's all centered around Python. Uh, Python for finance, algo trading, uh, more and more artificial intelligence in our field and we provide services to companies around the world. Um, training is at the core of what we do, organizing events as well, another boot camp for example in London later this year, we provide a university certification in terms of like doing the training but also certifying what people have done I've written a few books we do open source and on our platform we have these days close to 15,000 people um, active Python ones that are using our platform to learn Python to apply the nice packages that you are all aware of in a web-based environment I myself um, uh, 
you see here, I usually use this online so that people get kind of a visual impression or see me here live, but maybe it's worth to note the, um, my personal webpage. So all the talks that I give, all resources in the form of videos, slide decks, gists, whatever I use around the world when I give talks or for online webinars and so forth is stored there. So it's not about myself, it's just kind of like a collection of many, many resources with regard to uh, Python for finance if you're interested in. These are the three books. Actually, the middle one is keeping me busy as of now because I'm working on the second edition of the book. The first one came out in December in print 2014. And some four years later, many, many things have changed and it was, um, it was time indeed to update it because it was written based on Python 2.7 and, and many things that worked back then didn't work anymore. And um, if you have a print edition, this might be uh, indeed annoying in the end, and now we've updated it, I've updated it, the code is updated uh, completely, not completely, but almost completely redesigned at the very beginning, how it introduced Python and so forth. So, um, towards the end of the year, I'm a little bit behind schedule, to be frank, because I'm traveling quite a bit, as you might say here, uh, the book will probably come out in print. The other ones are more like really quant oriented, so it's really about derivatives and the special derivatives um, mentioned there about volatility and variance. Data-driven finance, my first proper topic here. This is what I really enjoy doing when I'm sitting on the airplane and just uh, yesterday, uh, or actually the day before, now I need to get back to my time zone. I, uh, on, the, on the airport I was reading the Financial Times there and I still enjoy reading the Financial Times and I indeed uh, discovered some new interesting stuff. Uh, if I get the opportunity, I read the Wall Street Journal as well. Again, mostly at the airport or on the airplane. I don't have a subscription, so I'm not waiting back home in the morning for a printed copy to arrive. But this is not what most people do anymore in order to get to some decisions in our field. What they do, and do since years, almost decades, we can say, is that they sit in front of the terminals. And here you see a new version, the HTML5-based version of Thomas Reuters uh, icon. Uh, there are Bloomberg terminals and a few more, but these are the two biggest players. And if people are interested in something about Apple, let's say, this is the example here, they probably won't pick up kind of like a bunch of newspapers, printed ones, and try to skip through and, and search for something. This is pretty, pretty inefficient. What they do is kind of they, they look the information up, be it some news about the Apple stock, be it some historical price data, down to the tick data level, uh, be it financial company ratios with regard to profits, debt equity ratios, whatever you're interested in, you find in a single place, you can drill down and get kind of the most minute details that are probably way out there about the <coughs> stock. But still, this is, for a single human being, might be okay, but in today's world, you need to be able to digest all the data that is coming in in real time, and this actually on a large scale, like in any other field as well. That's the reason why our field is driven these days by data in the same way as other fields are driven by data. And here you see the code to use the icon data API instead of like sitting in front of a screen and looking at it, you of course can retrieve data. And here the little example, and this is actually uh, coming now in production, so it's, it has been in beta, and we've been working with Tom's Reuters uh, for a longer time already. And uh, the little example that you see here should be easily uh, readable for every Pythonist. Uh, what I retrieve here is data for the Apple stock, my example. And I retrieve it for just 15 minutes for a single day. And I'm asking for tick level data. And when I have a look at this, you see that for these 15 minutes, we see some 1900 data rows in, it, in the resulting data frame. You see this fully integrated, I get delivered a data frame as a standard data format. And when I have a look at it, you see just two columns, it's a value and it's a volume. Because it's tick data, there is no open, high, low, close, it's on the tick level. So this is what the data is about. And you see a quarter of an hour, 2000 data rows, nothing you would like to print, nothing you would like to skip through as a human being on a screen or whatnot. But for machines, this is kind of like standard uh, stuff on a daily basis. And with the computational power that we have, the, the machines, the clusters, and so forth, it's kind of easy to retrieve data on that level for longer time periods, let's say for 
30, 50, or even 500 stocks and to do your analysis on this way. So this already, I think, shows that we human beings cannot compete anymore by reading through newspapers or whatever sources we have. This is already the domain of the machines, but not only in terms of structured financial data, meaning kind of like numbers. Uh, you might say, well, I still enjoy reading news articles, of course, but we have seen so many talks today in the stream here about natural language processing. News are also read these days by the machines because who can keep up with the stuff that is coming out on a daily basis? So I just um, this week saw a tweet about um, the number of news articles coming out on a daily basis, talked by Bloomberg actually, and it was mentioned that we have more than a million stories being published on a daily basis, and they process more than a million articles in their form and provided on their platform in machine readable form. Um, who could possibly read through something like this? Just machines can do and you see here with Tom's Reuters it's not that different uh, in mostly the same way that I request historical price data I request news articles. So standard text that can then be processed by all the nice uh, technologies packages that we have seen throughout the day already here. And you see it down there, I'm getting access to the full text. If I'm interested as a human being, I can read through it. But most probably I do stuff like word embeddings, topic modeling, or whatever I want to do. Sentiment analysis is one of the examples I've recently um, implemented based on this. So this is what machines can do much, much better. And human beings can keep up with the speed or the masses that are simply coming out there on a daily basis. So this is actually redefining how finance is done on a daily basis. And not only on a daily basis, but I was rather say on a second by second basis, because this is where the money is made or lost, that you're able to react in real time to what is coming out there. We all know that for most algorithms, huge amounts of data, big data, it's kind of a condita sine qua non, it's prerequisite, and we've seen the data is there. The data is there, machine readable form and now we can add the algorithms to the mix. There's actually been the first book about proper financial machine learning uh, which came out this year in March. I picked it up when I was in, in New York at the conference and Marcos, the author of this book, was speaking there so I got the uh, keynote there from him about this first chapter as well. So before I haven't heard of it, but I was really grateful because for, my, for myself, doing lots of training in this area, it's always good to have good references in this regard. And there are kind of a couple of nice quotes in there. The first one is about um, the author's doubt that the essential tool of econometrics, multivariate linear regression, which has been already invented in the 18th century, um, by Gauss before 1794, um, and he says here that it's hard to believe that something as complex as 21st century finance could be grasped by something as simple as inverting a covariance matrix. And maybe there's something to this, because I'd assume markets are nonlinear, hard to predict, and it would be really surprising if you can simply apply ordinary stress regression and you can come up with something pretty, pretty useful. Um, on the other hand, um, the last quote is actually my favorite one. Econometrics might be good enough to succeed in financial academia for now, uh, but succeeding in practice requires ML. I mean, in the end, it's from my personal point of view um, all about actually uh, statistics and underlying and math if you go one level deeper. So for me, my thinking world is just kind of different disciplines and they're kind of like um, not kind of hard boundaries. But I think the message is kind of clear that now that we have these fantastic things available, why not applying them in the same systematic and rigorous fashion that all the other tools have been applied in the recent past. And it's for sure that many, many people have done quite a ton of money based on econometrics method. They might not be that profitable anymore, but still, I mean, the history tells for many bigger hedge funds kind of a good story in this regard. The Technological Singularity. This is actually uh, a good intro book. Uh, I really like it because it's uh, more on a high level. And it's a general book about the potential technological singularity. But there is also algorithmic trading mentioned. That's the reason why I'm showing it here. And it is stated, admittedly, in 2015, but I think it doesn't 
have changed that much. That today's algorithmic trading programs are relatively simple and make only limited use of AI. However, this is sure to change. Artificial intelligence is beneficial in any domain where patterns have to be found in large quantities of data and effective decisions have to be taken on the basis of those patterns. And in particular, this has to be done rapidly. And pattern recognition is uh, indeed at the, one of the core parts of my talk in the sense of that many people in the financial industry that are involved in trading try to spot patterns. So I'm now not in a position where I say, well, I believe in patterns, I don't believe in patterns. Um, here's just kind of like courtesy of the web, a nice overview of a few patterns. There are many more that are written down in books or that you can learn in, in trading-oriented trainings. Uh, but my argument is, if there is indeed something in patterns-based trading, in chartist exercises, then I'm pretty sure that machines are much, much better in spotting these patterns and in evaluating what to do based on these patterns. Again, this argument, from my point of view, is independent of whether you believe in it or not. But if there is something in these patterns, then related to uh, the quote here, machines are simply better at doing this. So, um, so every, every hardcore believer in charting should immediately jump on the ML AI uh, wagon and say, well, uh, I believe in it, now let's do the machine, the trick that I have been trying for maybe decades or years in that sense. On a rather high level in finance, I think we have suffered from what is here called the beauty myth. This is related to physics and to the grand unified theories that are kind of labeled as being so nice but of actually no practical use. And we have in finance at least as many elegant theories based on elegant equations, mathematically rigorous to prove and so forth, but that haven't proven that useful in practice. And uh, therefore I like this here, the beauty myth, because many, many professors in our field, finance, finance professors who are famous, have written big books and have made quite a bit of money in consulting, investment banks and so forth, they have made a living out of that to come up with nice equations usually, and you can have a look through that many theories of the last, let's say, five decades when quant actually began, or maybe even four decades, I should say, um, that most of the stuff that you see is based on normally distributed returns that are simply non-existent in our markets. So it's all but normal. And the second thing that most of the theories rely is linear relationships. They also mostly non-existent. Many, many actually really famous theories like the plex Folds model is based on log normal returns. The CAPM model is based on a linear relationship plus normally distributed returns and so forth. You can go through the history of finance and it's all based basically on assumptions that from the outset have no practical use or no practical reflection, I'd rather say, in practice. Therefore, of course, many, many researchers have come up with alternatives and said, well, now let's assume a different distribution based on blah, blah, and so forth. That's all fine, but many, many theories that are still taught uh, on a daily basis around uh, the world at the universities are kind of here more of the category. It's, it's beautiful, but of no practical use in the end. When we see how this chart now presents it, we have the financial markets, and X here stands for big data. Whatever the big data is, the one million articles per day, the I don't know how many petabytes of tick data that are generated on a weekly basis around the globe. And the markets process the data in real time. So these are the markets. And um, they are most, most probably nonlinear and for sure complex. And they are changing over time. So it's not a physical reality. If you have found out the physical relationship, you call it the physical law. And you say, well, this is probably to stay there for the ages. In finance, it isn't the case. So things are changing over time. Finance history was mostly driven here what I represent by brains, like the finance professors and well, or the mathematical professors that came up with elegant the theories like f of x is, I don't know what. And then once you start doing the empirical work and try to see whether the theories can predict markets or can prove useful in markets, can explain what is going on, then most probably you see that the results are not the same. So M is not really useful for pricing stocks and so forth. 
On the other hand, now AI and finance, or what I call it sometimes finance, with the AI in the middle of it, uh, gets back to the scientific method. That people say, well, now we have computation power, we have big machines, we have unlimited storage, basically we can have, I don't know, terabyte of RAM or whatever we need. Now let's start with the big data. I mean, in history, in the 70s and 80s, you needed to go like via shortcuts. You needed to do simplifying assumptions because we haven't had in the finance industry the computation power needed to get the big data root. So, and in that sense, now we have everything available and getting back to the scientific method, which means we start with the data. We have models that might be complex, and some people say, well, this is a black box, and oh, I don't know what the deep neural network really does, and so forth. But in the end, it might, work, it might work a little better. It might not be perfect in predicting something or explaining, but I'm pretty sure in many, many areas, and this is the case, and it's done on a daily basis. Uh, I'm talking about idle trading, but the retail area has been much, much further. So, for example, with regard to credit scoring and providing credit, retail credit, it's all done by the machines. If you apply online to it, there's classical uh, credit, classical classification algorithms that work there. And what they do there actually to get the impression that somebody is checking it, that they really slow down the process and wait for like half a minute, a minute, so that the applicant has the impression there's something going on. The, a credit score can be generated in milliseconds. You know, but, yeah, we see that this is all working there, but in the financial and the trading field, uh, it's a little bit different actually. What is kind of fantastic from my point of view is that our field, I think for the first time in history of finance, so starting in the 50s, later 50s, with the first quant finance models, um, that we now have a huge influence from outside of the field. That people are jumping on things um, that have been developed, brought to our world from completely different areas and sources. So here I try to um, illustrate the, the parallel issues with regard to machine and deep learning where they use for example to build self-driving cars with all the problems um, the major thing here is prediction prediction what is happening in front of me behind me what happens if i do abc and it's all based of course on data lots of data lots lots of data uh, optimized algorithms hardware is required to build something like this um, optimization training learning procedures testing validation this is the hard part there particular when you when you build self-driving cars I just read another long feature article about this topic very interesting uh, and for us in trading AI based algo trading machine it's not that different it's basically also prediction we have similar uh, bases we can use our data that we have available the very same algorithms with some adjustments the very same hardware uh, same procedures in the middle and I think we have two major advantages there the one is we don't have the embodiment problem so we are not interacting with the physical world in finance we just place orders which are really abstract you know it's just kind of like a message sent a package sent so this is easy and first of all I think we don't have the issue that our car can hit somebody on the sidewalk so it's just like in an abstract world we might lose some money but I think this is not that um, serious compared to what self-driving car might cause harm in that sense. So I think a few things are more easy and our field, again, benefits tremendously, I guess, from uh, developments that are initiated and are implemented in completely different areas. Now let me come to an example strategy to make it, um, to make it a little bit more concrete. Uh, strategy idea here is to trade the single instrument uh, in leverage fashion to amplify the returns. So for those who are a little bit of finance know what I'm talking about. Positions might be long and short, which means I can bet on, on an increase in the market or on a decrease. Um, this is not that simple to implement with every instrument, but with the platform we are currently using, it's pretty uh, simple. We are currently mostly concerned with mid-frequency data, so it's nothing about high frequency where all this talk about algo trading actually started high frequency trading is not really about predicting something and and also not about using machine learning algorithms nor any standard statistical algorithm most of the stuff in a high frequency area is uh, implemented deterministically so here it's mid frequency five or ten minutes or so, uh, too fast algorithms are standard ones like classification 
uh, algorithms that we use. And the goal would be to come up with something what we in the industry call alpha generating algorithms, meaning that there is an outperformance of the benchmark, but the benchmark can go down considerably, and I don't want to have like instead of minus 12%, just minus 10%. This would be already an outperformance. What we also want is an absolute return, and last but not least, also low correlation. Because in our industry, what you see these days is kind of like that we have an overcrowded strategy place, so to say. The big players are mostly doing the same thing over and over again. So deploying billions and billions of capital, and we have seen this for the first time in a very serious fashion, uh, crashing down in 08, what they called the quant meltdown, because everybody was implementing the same strategies, and when they wanted to get out, it was pretty hard, it didn't work, and many, many people lost huge amounts of money. I don't want to see in a single room like this here. Uh, so local relation would also be something robustness, so I'm always uh, looking for something that has an acceptable performance independent of parameters. So overfitting is the, one of the major problems in our area. We, we can easily get an in-sample performance which is fantastic, maybe not 38 million percent what we saw in my info slide, but fantastic in-sample performance is not a big deal. So everybody here in the room, I'm pretty sure, with a little bit of tweaking and working with the data, uh, we get good results in this regard. The uh, programming, of course, is done with Python, but only standard stuff. So what I'm now going to show uh, from now on is mostly basic stuff, no sophisticated uh, things left and right, Python, NumPy, and so for scientific stack, I think is the right thing here. And what we want to have is something like this, where we trade Euro, US dollar, here is without leverage, so there's no leverage included here. And you would start at the beginning, this is normalized to one, where you say, well, no matter what capital, let's say 100,000 or 10,000 invested, and you see the evolution over time of your portfolio. The differences will be profit and loss, but here you see kind of like the portfolio value itself. And when we uh, here did the sequential training, back test split 40% of the data to train, 60% to test. You see actually what such a strategy will be after. You see the orange line, this is the market. You see the blue line, which is the strategy itself. And the middle one, the green one, is including transaction costs. Because we need to pay transaction costs in the markets. Uh, buying and selling stuff is not for free, unfortunately. Otherwise, many strategies would be much more profitable. Um, so this is just one example, and there's no guarantee, and no provide, and not providing any kind of investment advice, and so forth. This is based on a certain fixed data set, and I'm just showing you more or less what we are after, not what is kind of like easy to implement thereafter. There is kind of like a randomized backtest, which makes it a little bit harder that we break up the sequential structure of the time series. Some people argue that it is not the right approach, but I like to have it as a validation. And you see, it still works somehow. Uh, the blue line is kind of outperforming okay, but including transaction costs, it's not that nice anymore. But this is the more meaningful chart where we have tested 288 algorithm configurations. And this is basically what I mean by robust strategy. So I'm, I'm more looking for something that no matter how I choose certain parameters within bands, of course, not like you know going to zero or infinity, but within sen somehow sensible bands, uh, the performance of the algorithm doesn't deteriorate like by a small change in a single parameter. So some kind of stability and some kind of robustness, and this is what you see here, as long as um, you see in the upper end, the uh, left hand side, the orange ones are is the performance of the um, algorithm over all configuration. Then we have the, the blue ones which are less transaction costs. And there we have a few that are losing money, but more or less everything is above. So this is what I would like to have, what, what I'm really after. And this is based <coughs> on uh, different situations. You see mostly three different situations where the market is losing money, where the market is around zero, and where the market is making money in simple terms. So trying to get this also figured out. So this is what we would like to have, that we have such an algorithm, so this would be kind of an ideal world, which performs that way. Basically, no matter what configuration, and no matter what market scenario we are currently in, the market is able to outperform. And this is independent of if the market goes down, loses money, or goes up, or stays neutral. This is what is non-correlation, actually, and what means our performance plus, not only relative our performance, plus absolute positive performance. This would be the ideal world. 
Everybody actually in our industry is after something like this. Here another way of uh, representing this. Everything which is in a green field is better than the best performance of the benchmark and everything that is in the red field is worse than the worst performance of the benchmark. So all greens are kind of fantastic because they are better than the maximum that we have seen in the markets. But this is kind of like an idea what we are after. This is based, this was derived based on 10 minute bars or 5 minute bars, I don't remember which exactly I used there. Uh, this was just based on scikit-learn stuff. A little bit of tweaking with the data and playing with the data. And again, this is just based on snapshots and no guarantee that this would work in the future. The AI machine is actually not per se about a certain algorithm or about a certain strategy. It's more or less about the following ideas. And here a few background bullets and uh, a little bit of uh, general thinking. Um, some, some five years ago, I was sitting down at my birthday and I said, well, what about the next five years? And uh, back then I coined for myself the term the Python Quants. The Python Quant, actually singular, and later on renamed our company to the Python Quants. But that much later, and now, uh, five years later, uh, I was thinking about the next five years, and I think with all that is happening, we will move towards something what I call the AI quant or AI quants that people working in our industry will more and more rely on machine learning based, AI based technologies to do the work that has been done previously with econometrics or classical things like let's say stochastic differential equations, stochastic calculus, and so forth. So ML, AI will play a much more important role. So I think um, all tools around this will become more important. And I simply find it interesting as well, it's exciting. And then there is another question, I've been asked this uh, yesterday night for dinner, I get this regularly, uh, do you trade, do you do algo trading on your own? Because travel the world, do online trading all day about algo trading. And uh, up until recently, I could only say, no, not really, but we're planning to do it. Now we started doing it on a small scale, we'll talk about this. Um, so it's simply fantastic, and I simply wanted to get involved in the form of skin in the game. And the other side is that we are interacting with hundreds of people who learn on our platform and with our programs and classes, Python for algo trading, but most people I'm writing here many people, but most people, I must say, fail when it gets to deploying what I was presenting to practice. So they come up with ideas, they come up with good results, and say, now I want to get started trading. But putting something in production robustly, reliably, this is kind of what the big uh, thing is. So usually I like to say, well, an average algorithm, and this is also a number I heard from Quantopia, might have 200 or 250 lines of code, but the deployment might involve 10,000 lines of code. So the people can manage like, to come up with 250 lines of code, but the proper deployment thing is a completely different story. And for me, it's also like then to walk the talk and come up with proof of concept. And for this proof of concept, I think robust, reliable execution is a conditio sine qua non, um, because we, can have the best ideas if we are not able to execute this perfectly or close to perfect um, it won't do that much you can have the best algorithm if you built a car for self-driving purposes the algorithm might be do the best thing if the car doesn't do what the algorithm says I mean there's no point in then having this combination and after all it's a fascination for the markets and betting getting direct feedback I think we hardly have other areas where you can such, get such immediate feedback as we see. And typical companies interacting with consumers and so forth is mostly indirect here in financial markets. We see it live in front of us. Every penny that we lose or win is visible. And I always thought that with our program, this is the core, this is our flagship offering, the university certificate in Python for agro trading, 16 weeks as of today. My goal was always to bring people to that point, but it wasn't enough. Still. Still such a long program with that many resources, um, I must learn uh, is not enough for that. Therefore, I usually talk about the deployment gap in terms of like the brokers and platforms. Of course, they want to have people that trade kind of often because this is when they make money. 
based on the bid ask spread. And people want to trade, so we train them, so we provide them practice, and they do their research. But there's still this last mile problem. They do not get across the chasm actually to get up and running. There might be different reasons, skills, budget, time, and so forth, that prevent people from getting started. The machine here is kind of a schematic thing. It has also evolved already. It's supposed to take care of all the stuff around the algorithm itself. That you have kind of like, sometimes I use the, the picture like SpaceX is building the rockets to put like the satellites of other companies into space. This is my idea here that we build the rocket which will bring all the satellites to space because the one thing is of completely different nature, I would say, than the other one. So in that sense, the machine should close the deployment gap and then it takes care of the deployment, does the data processing and manages the strategy lifecycle. Also, the brokers won't support you with the lifecycle of a complete strategy, which might, co might consist of 500 trades. They are kind of optimized in, like, to manage a single trade or multiple trades at the same time, but not for a strategy which might consist of, I don't know, um, 250 long and 250 short positions in that sense. And here, a schematic view where we say, well, the brain must come from somebody else, the AI-based algorithmic trading strategy, and the AI machine is what is kind of the body. It's the car, and the algorithms should come from somebody else for the self-driving car. Here, it's the human being, and we take care of the body, and the brain is to be provided by those who are doing it. So the AI machine, in that sense, you see a screenshot, is about standardized deployment of AI-based algo strategies and if you see maybe it is still running let me quickly check if you see this here um, we are currently here trading um, as you can see this is the account this is all small money as you just kind of like risking currently 100 euro 100 for the reason because we now can easily read what the percentage gain is in this case so i'm happy that there is a profitable trade now running there's no guarantee for that i would love to have it all the time that way uh, so that we can scale it up uh, later on but here see as it works so this uh, i don't know if this is a good trade before there was another trade probably it has changed uh, two times let me quickly check it might have closed a trade for whatever reason um, let me see here now spread cost, price, balance, so you see what it, what is it doing. And all the trades that you see here, they have been placed by the machine. So there's nothing that we have done manually. Um, this goes back, I don't know, until the 31st of May. This is just a few things. This is running in a test mode, so to say. And uh, of course, what we all like to have is that there are only profitable trades. Of course, you will have losers, but if you're uh, the number of your winners is higher or actually your wins are higher on average then you should be able to make some decent money and this is what we are after but currently once again it's not yet about the algorithm itself what we do because we need something to run because the machine needs to be tested but the algorithm is still kind of like second tire and not the first thing our focus is currently on the execution side of things because this is the the harder part here is also part of the machine where you can do backtesting, for example. You backtest some algorithm, you see the results, you say, well, this is kind of what I want to implement. Then you click Add Live Model and this gets started immediately and the machine then takes care of the rest. Uh, and currently we are fine tuning stuff like trading stop losses, take profit uh, marks and so forth. Because um, when I say we, uh, and you see it here when I illustrate this, when I say we trade on 10 minute bars is one example of course this doesn't mean that it's just going about 10 minutes so actually it's changing on a sub second level and you also need to take care in terms of risk management what is happening um, on a on an intra interval intra bar level and you see here now it, it goes against my position when you see the five second ones that it's increasing the euro gbp uh, rate and this eats up my intermediate unrealized profits but the basic idea of all what I'm talking about here is that you have and going back to the 10 minute bars which all this is based that you have a machine that executes an algorithm where the algorithm says now go short or go long and this is done on a daily basis with the current ingestion of the data that is coming up so that 
indeed, like a self-driving car, you have a self-trading machine. This is the basic idea behind that, and our focus is not to reach out like with something like this to the big hedge funds and do this anyways, but to retail traders maybe one day or smaller companies that might not have uh, the background or time or whatever uh, to implement something like this. Because there are, again, many, many people, and Quantopian I think is a good example, they have 150,000 people on their Python-based research environment platform, and everybody there comes up with algorithm, but I think it's less than one per mil, or every 10,000 algorithm is traded at all. So it's kind of, you, get, you lose all the intellectual capital through this um, filter, actually, where you say, well, the deployment gap is simply uh, too large for many people to cross. Um, and to get started with it because they are lacking kind of the execution capabilities, not the ideas uh, nor the accounts to get started. It's just kind of like this bridge that we need there. All is done in uh, again in Python backend, many other technologies. Uh, later on, if you have questions, Jonathan in the backend who has been giving a talk today here uh, happens to be one of the main developers here. So. Pretty happy that we are together here. If there are technical questions, we can answer them as well. Related to um, to uh, the book, actually, I, I show here six steps that um, Marcus in his financial machine learning book points out how modern machine learning based funds should be structured. We are striving to something like an industrial chain in this regard so that we can empower, again, retail traders and or smaller investment companies to implement such an industrial chain, which today is only kind of preserved more or less kind of the playing field of the 50 billion uh, dollar hedge funds, the biggest ones in the pond, where we provide data sources, feature analysis is done, the strategies are different, backtesting, deployment is here, the core AI machine, full automation, audit report, also a topic in particular if you're managing outside money, auditing and reporting, very important and also to have the proper portfolio oversight. This brings me already to the last part outlook. Here with one of my favorite quotes from Terminator 2. Skynet begins to learn at a geometric rate. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern time. Um, in our field and in technology and AI in general, we see many, currently many exponential forces at work in parallel. And for the financial industry, I think this holds true even more so. That we now benefit tremendously from technology improvements, the, the multi-billion dollar budgets, actually, that all the financial companies, the big banks, are investing on a yearly basis. Uh, then you see also another trend with regard to capital accumulation. Successful funds like Two Sigma are not only successful, once they are successful, other people bring their money as well. So it's kind of an accelerating trend. And Staying with Two Sigma, they then start accumulating talent as well. So uh, He just left, but he was working for more than two years at Two Sigma. Wes McKinney, uh, the original, the key author of uh, Pandas. And the big funds, they have the funds actually to hire all the talent. And uh, you can read many articles that all the people are, that are doing research at uh, universities in the areas of AI, machine learning and so forth, get hired away by technology and financial companies. This is what we currently see, so uh, more to come is the message here. And uh, how fast, how influencing this is. Who knows this book? Nick Bostrom, Superintelligence. One of the major publications about singularity or what is around there. In 2014, he points out in his book, and he's one of the best known authors in the field research, as professor at Cambridge. Uh, that go playing programs have been improving, blah, blah, blah. This rate of improvement continues, they might beat the human world champion in about a decade. We all know the story about AlphaGo and how long it took. Actually, it didn't take 10 years. Um, the European champion was beaten in 2015. The world champion was beaten in 2016. Which means instead of 10 years, what one of the best known, best informed researchers, I must say, was predicting, it took only two years, and I think there is this uh, there is this famous quote by Bill Gates, which goes along the lines of that we uh, usually overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in ten years. I think this might be now turned around a little bit. 
Currently, I think many people are underestimating what can be accomplished with the new technologies uh, in a very short period of time. And this is illustrated here by Alpha Zero, the self-reinforcement learning-based algorithm which replaced the other kind of supervised, trained uh, models before, uh, where after 40 days, Alpha Zero, again, based on playing against itself, was better than any other engine before trained and not only that, that the algorithms are getting better, hardware requirements are coming down as well, which is the lower chart, the bar chart that you see. So when they started out, they used 176 GPUs and they ended up with four TPUs only and you see kind of not only the increase in the performance of the algorithms in terms of days of training, uh, but also the decrease over time, so to say, for newer <coughs> generations and I think if these trends are, are kind of some indication for what to come, not only finance but in the general world, we will see many more amazing things in this regard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Is. Um, let's have two questions, and then after that, we don't run away, please. We will gather here and do a quick photo shoot, and then you are released. <laughs> do we have questions in the room? It's Friday yep. night. This might be pretty. Uh, this was a fairly stupid question. I don't really have a background in finance. But if, if increasingly larger number of players start using algorithmic trading strategies, doesn't the alpha go away? Sure, it's the argument of like increased competition, someday perfect competition, um, and arbitraging away. I think currently we are still pretty nascent in most areas, so I hope that there are still some gold nuggets to be mined. Um, but of course, this will be a major argument um, in terms of. This is also a question that is typically asked for, like, for myself as a retail trader, can I compete against the big ones? Or like, it's kind of similar question. And I always say, well, you need to find your niche here. You know, it's kind of like the big ones are only interested in strategies that have enough capacity, meaning they can deploy 200 million upwards and so forth. Maybe for the retail trader, it is below. Or you go to different asset classes. Or you have your uh, local stuff that you might want to uh, mine, so to say, for your profits. Um, but of course, I mean, if we one day have all kind of like uh, AI optimized uh, chips on our phones and do deep learning on the go, the question is, uh, but I, I don't have a satisfying answer. Okay, last question for today. Um, one of the well-known arguments about algorithmic trading is the black swans, that you have these very rare events which do most of the damage or will give you most of the profits. Uh, how do you deal with training a machine learning model on historical data with regards to those very rare events? That's a good question. I mean, the, the typical argument goes as follows. Um, I mean, if you, if you miss out on the top 10 days over the last 15 years in the S&P 500, you would only have half the performance. So this is an argument actually for being passively invested over time, for like retirement saving and so forth. But well, on the other hand, what we have seen actually is that the performance of many indices, of many instruments, and so forth, have, has coming down. Although we are now in a bull run since years, one of the longest in history since 07, 08, more or less. Uh, but still, it's hard to make money. Therefore, the argument for algorithmic trading, I would start, is that it's a form of active trading. So, I, contrary to the passive investment, I try to in the form of alpha, which I introduced, I try to benefit in any scenario um, with regard to outperforming the benchmark, having a positive performance, and being not that much correlated. So, have a low correlation, or in a perfect world, not, no correlation. This was the one part of the question from my point of view. The other one is with regard to rare events. Uh, of course, you can. This is the same for like the self driving car once again. If something happens. Uh, that the algorithm has never seen, then some weird stuff can happen. Um, this holds true for such trading algorithms as well. In that sense, what you need to build in, of course, is kind of like safety measures for the car, risk measures in that sense for the algorithm. So, well, under certain circumstances, I stop all the algorithms. 
under certain circumstances I do ABC or stop even trading or um, this is something that can be programmed there as well but this is then a little bit beyond the buff on the side from the algorithm which is the management of the algorithm itself um, I mean financial markets are driven by these variables like crashes and whatever's happening you know revaluations by central banks for the currencies and so forth I think the only way of dealing with this tail risk so to say is to have measures in place that then from the outside get into it and say well no stop <laughs> on the other hand I even discussed this this morning uh, I said well we need to come up with something which what we try to do currently is, is benefiting from the movements what I was showing you know here this this reversal you know, this is now a, a fixed screenshot this will be ideal that I get to reverse it. if everything is kind of in this area this is kind of nice but we want to maybe even not risk too much for tailwinds we want to benefit from tailwinds as well yep. this is the other side that you always are positioned to some extent that you say well if an extreme move happens then I want to get kind of like 500 percent out of the money options or whatever you can do in this regard but of course there's no an algorithm can only learn something that they have seen before or it might be within a certain range or something and uh, I need to risk manage everything okay Thank you very much. Welcome. Um.